So let's begin with Steve from Young Ocean Explorers. Steve ran his own construction business for 20 years and then left it to chase his dream of telling stories about the underwater that he loves. Since he started filming underwater professionally in 2008, his footage has appeared on the BBC, Discovery TV, National Geographic and TVNZ in numerous, numerous award-winning documentaries including Blackfish, which many of you I'm sure have seen, uh, and The Woman Who Swims with Killer Whales. His greatest passion is to show off New Zealand's stunning underwater world. Steve says that most people don't realise that 93% of New Zealand's territory is ocean and that this zone is every bit as spectacular as the land and his aim is to bring this world alive for people who might never experience it. Last year he was part of the Sir Peter Blake Trust's Young Blake expedition to the Kermadex where he documented the 30 young voyages underwater experiences and he says he's stoked to have had the opportunity to visit these remote islands again in 2015. You just came back, didn't you? Yes, did Like a minute ago, yes. He's got a 14 year old daughter I was just full, who went with him and I was just full of admiration at that kind of parenting approach. Well, if anybody else got 14 year old daughters, stick them under the ocean. You can't hear them jibber jabber. It's fantastic, it's genius. So, uh, Steve believes the key issue facing the Hauraki Gulf, Te Kapa Moana, is how we get people to value what's underneath our water as much as we value what's on top of it or beside it. So, give a huge warm welcome to Steve Hathaway. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. I have the um, unenviable position of um, going first, and I had <coughs> no expectation of this. Some of the brightest minds around are after me, so um, maybe this is my opportunity, but anyway. Um, I, I've done a show called Young Ocean Explorers with my daughter Riley, who's now 14. We did um, 10 episodes in Northland. Eight of them were based in the Hauraki Gulf. And um, our aim is to inspire kids to love our ocean by bringing it alive, that they go, wow, that's amazing, I want an experience for myself, and give them a reason to want to look after it and care for it as much as the land. Um, I, had, I had an experience um, just before I went to the Kermadex, I've just been up there for 12 days, and just before I went there I went to the Mokahiana Islands, which is probably seen as one of the most pristine island groups in the Hauraki Gulf. Phenomenal. And um, just I enjoy swimming kilometres of coastline and spearing snapper, you know, I, I enjoy spearfishing, I don't do a lot of it these days because I love being behind a camera, but on this particular day I swam a number of kilometres of coastline. and. Um, what I saw before me, like I love diving the Mokahi now, it's absolutely spectacular. Like I had my 11 year old son with me as well and to have a sandagger's ras hand feeding out of your hand and to be able to stroke them and that is just something that every kid should do, you know, because they're always going to be um, to love the ocean when they see something like that. But anyway, when I was swimming the coastline from below about 5 metres to about 12 metres um, was devoid of seaweed, was devoid of any kelp at all. And I, just something that I um, was thinking about is like, well, if that was on the land, seaweed and, and is, we've got about 850 species in New Zealand, about 30% of them are endemic to New Zealand. And I was thinking, imagine the Waitakere's, you know, that all of a sudden we had vast swathes of the Waitakere's that were fouled <laughs> of trees. You know, what would our emotional response be to that? And yet in the Hauraki Gulf, you know, we've got huge areas of kinnabarans that have been taken out. And my thing is, um, as I'm sure others are, is how do we engage hearts and minds so they value what is underneath the surface just as much as what we have on the land? And um, in my mind, it's just as spectacular, even more so. And uh, the New Zealand, we have about 70%, I think, is estimated of our native species are found in the ocean. It's just as much part of our story in New Zealand and it should be celebrated and cared for just as much. Um, one other brief story, I live in Cowell Bay and I've um, got a, bay, um, a place called Irish Shoal that occasionally gets scallops and something that really um, pushed it home to me as I was free diving for scallops, I started at one end of the shoal and there's these beautiful alluvial grainy kind of broken up shells that look, you know, beautiful white sand and as I was going along we, we went along probably about seven, eight hundred metres along the bank as we got further in, it turned into sludge. I thought, imagine if we treated the land like that. You know, sometimes with the ocean, we celebrate it. We, we're great with the ocean. We've got some incredible sailors, the world's best. We've got a very good sailor on the panel here. You know, we're great on the surface of the water, but sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, how do we 
get people to value that just as much. It's just as much her, our story as Kiwis. And uh, that's us. Fantastic, Steve. Thank you. Round of applause for Steve. <laughs> and so that that is the issue for Steve: is that how do we how do we do that? How do we get people to care about something that they can't see unless they Donna diving mask, right? So what are the responses from the rest of the people on the panel to that idea? And in terms of asking him questions, but also in offering solutions? Well, clearly um, what Steve is doing with his TV programs is, is part of that. He's doing a pretty good job himself of making people aware of these issues. <coughs> I agree, and actually Steve sort of preempted what I'm going to talk about as well, <laughs> for, for obvious reasons, because I think what I'm going to try and talk about is how I think we did achieve that a little bit just before Christmas in this country. It was uh, very good to hear you bring us to the point of the tragedy of Cray 2, which is the Cray fishery from Waipu in the north to East Cape in the south. It's a great big cray fishery and the dreadful decision that was made last year to implement a management rule for the first time in the history of that iconic vital ecosystem <coughs> service providing species crayfish where we see a catch per unit of effort of 0.37 a kilo, 0.37 kilos per pot lift entrenched and regularised and made okay. That's Cray 2, happened last year, first time up. 0.37 kilos a kilo, <coughs> 0.37 kilos per pot lift in any other cray fishery in Aotearoa would result in immediate closure of the fishery, all pots out of the water. So you brought us to that really salient point straight away where we are being let down by the interpretation of the Fisheries Act by the... Uh, the management, by the managers. Yeah, just um, in regards to cray fishing, like, um, I love going to Little Barrier. Little Barrier, historically, it's been a wonderful place to get crayfish. And uh, one of my good friends, he used to go out there every weekend, they had, and they used to have five or six people on their boat. And they used to get their limit for five or six people on their boat every week. And I, I remember saying to him probably about 15 years ago, I was like, mate, it's not going to last if we keep on treading it like that, you know. And I'm guilty. I'm probably more guilty than most for taking a lot of crayfish in my life. But I said, that spot will not last forever. And he goes, oh, mate, there's, a, there's so many here, you know. And Little Barrier is probably, you know, one of the... It's, it's a shadow of what it was. And one of the stories we did with Young Ocean Explorers was on crayfish and... Um, Roger Gracie has done um, research in Tafra Nui that he's taken, was it since about 75 or? Uh, about 77. 77. Yeah. So he's done um, transects where they've taken crayfish counts. And near the beginning of his counts, it was um, minute numbers, like a few crayfish per hectare. And now, what is it up to? It's about 1,000 it, legal crayfish per hectare. That's right. It, it reached 1,000 legal crays per hectare in 2010 backed off a little bit from then, which I'm interpreting as spillover. Yeah, and it's, you don't have to go very far outside of the reserve to get back to that minute number that Roger was talking about. It's such staggering numbers that it's like, I almost don't like talking about it because people think you're exaggerating, but you only have to go into Tafra Nui for yourself. And I, when, like, I've done a bit of filming in there, and I've, there are so many huge big crayfish, like way better than, way better than Goat Island. Massive big crayfish, and um, actually Roger said to me just before it became a marine reserve, because it's been a marine park for, for a long time, but it's just become a marine reserve in the last couple of years, and he goes, Steve, it's going to become a marine reserve and you won't be allowed to feed crayfish and, um, as soon as that happens. And it was a technicality that we could, and um, we went out one day and I was hand feeding these crayfish, and to see a huge crayfish, like five kilos marching across the bottom, like <laughs> trying to grab this thing off you, you know? And I was like, man, you know, um, and Mark was just saying earlier about just, um, you know, that we have it in our culture about grabbing the biggest and the best, you know. And they're the, they're the major breeders, actually. I'd rather Mark talk about that because he's, he's so much um, about the big breeders and the significance of them. Yeah, um, thanks, Steve. I, I, just what's occupying my thinking. Kia ora, everybody. I'm, I'm Mark Horams. Uh, from my point of view, an answer to your question about how do we get a land based dwelling creature like us 
to care about a place that we don't actually live in. For me, it comes back to a lot of things that are difficult for us to get our head around, places we don't want to go. I think about prostate cancer. I think about depression. And I think about the people who've actually opened our eyes to that and have become champions for us to understand that while we might not want to go there and who wants to go where prostate cancer is, but <laughs> Buck Shelford did. You know, He's the guy who put up his hand and said, you know what? I'm going to be a leader and say this is something we need to pay attention to. And you blokes, let's get into it. Let's think about this and let's do something about it. John Kerwin put up his hand around depression and said, I've struggled with it. This is not something we need to keep pushing away. And so I think the answer is around leadership. It's about people who've got the guts to stand up and say, this is not right. We need to be doing more. And a lot of those people are sitting next to me. You know, guys like Roger Grace have been talking about these things and studying it for decades. Steve has decided to make a major life change and make a difference. I hear Scott and his passion just bashing the table over and over again. Uh, and so the, the number of young marine biologists, well, perhaps not now because they're a lot younger, but certainly when I first started as an academic 20 years ago, who said to me, I want to be a marine biologist because I saw Jacques Cousteau's undersea world. There's one leader who inspired a whole generation of people to give a crap about the ocean. Mm -hmm. So for me, a lot of it comes down to leadership, and that's why I'm delighted with this award this evening about ocean champions. That's what's going to make the difference. Mm -hmm. Great. That's the end of our 10 minutes. That was a useful 10 minutes, yes? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about so far is <coughs> a shift in <coughs> image and a shift in cultural thinking, which says that New Zealand is wider than our shores, right? So that's Most what you're talking about. You, you, I mean, that, that figure that New Zealand is 93% ocean is that already made a shift happen in my head. Mm. And you're also talking about finding somebody who will be the face of the ocean, in a sense.